All right. So uh, welcome to preparing your investor pitch deck. If you showed up here by accident, you might as well stay because I think it's going to be very informational and uh, as well as entertaining. So this workshop is hosted by Startup SAC. Uh, Startup SAC, if you're unfamiliar, is a, a nonprofit that helps entrepreneurs and small business owners both launch and grow their companies. And you can find out more about us at startupsac.com. And uh, we're not taking questions right now. Uh, you could type something in the chat and I'll answer it when I have a chance. Okay, so uh, as a nonprofit, a lot of our funding comes from local organizations who are interested in having more startups in the Sacramento region. And I'd like to acknowledge our sponsors. We've got SMUD, Witten Law, Moneta Ventures, Stoll Reeves, Weintraub Tobin, Cap City, Digitally Driven, Three Steps Forward, the Metro Business Center, and Ernst and & Young. Okay, so I am uh, going to show you a short video from SMUD right now. Um, oh, shoot. Uh, sorry, I forgot to do the, the sound thing when I did the share thing. <laughs> uh, who knows what I mean by that? Let's see. Um, share sound. Don't you think that should be the default? Okay. So. Probably not. At SMUD, we're committed to zero carbon by 2030. We're creating more energy from renewable resources, reconfiguring our power plants to improve air quality, electrifying our fleet, greening our buildings, and accelerating clean energy with our first grid-scale battery farm. The Clean Power City movement is happening. For 37 ways you can join the charge, visit cleanpowercity.org. All right, so thank you, SMUD. Uh, for those of you who don't know, <coughs> uh, SMUD, is, SMUD supports uh, quite a few nonprofit organizations in the community. Uh, a, a number of them are entrepreneurial support organizations, you know, as well as your classic nonprofits. So uh, thank you, SMUD, for all the support you provide. So um, as I mentioned, today's workshop is preparing your investor pitch deck. Our presenter is JDM, who some know as Josh David Miller. He is uh, the founder of The Right Box. He's also the host of the Zero to Traction podcast, or I should say the co-host of that podcast. Cameron Law is uh, the other co-host, and then the host of the Startup Traction Hotline. So if you like what you hear from Josh here today, then you'll want to uh, subscribe or check out those other programs that he does to help entrepreneurs. So I'm going to go ahead and, and stop sharing my screen and invite Josh to share his, and we'll get started. Well, all right. Okay, there we go. And I tried to unmute myself while it was asking me to unmute, and it was a whole thing. But we're there now. And good morning, everyone. We got some, just looking at the list here, got some friends here. So to everyone out there that I know, hello, and thank you for showing up, even though you know who I am. And for the, those of you I don't know, unfortunately, you're about to find out. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and get started here. Uh, I love the turnout, Laura. We got like 30 people here. So pretty, pretty awesome. Uh, I, I love that. Everybody always turns out to talk pitching. Um, so I'll try my best not to disappoint y'all with that. But uh, yeah, like Laura said, I'm just gonna go ahead and, and share my my screen, got some slides that we'll go through. I, I'm going to talk for I, I think about three and a half hours, and then we'll take questions. Um, but uh, hopefully it won't seem like three and a half hours. Uh, no, we'll uh, just go ahead and do some uh, 
some remarks for a little bit. And then once we get through uh, this, happy to take any questions that you guys have or workshop a little bit. And it's a little harder on the Zoom environment. So and we won't be doing breakout rooms or anything like that. But uh, if you if you want to uh, you know, try uh, to workshop a few parts at the end, let's do that. If you have a question during this, uh, during my, my the speaking portion of this, Feel free to either raise your Zoom hand or drop the question in the chat. I'll do my best to monitor that, and Laura will help me out. And uh, yeah, otherwise we'll we'll have space for for questions at the 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 end. Um, so uh, as as Laura said, uh, you know my name is uh, my name is JDM. Uh, Josh David uh, Josh David Miller is uh, is what that uh, goes by there, and uh, uh, that's that's me. That's another version of me there. If you see me out and about, and you know we're at an in person event or something like that, it'll probably be recognized as the guy wearing the bright colored shoes. I've got yellow on today. Uh, that's that's my jam here this morning as well. But I also have some other unfortunate monikers. People have called me J Doom. Uh, I actually rather lean into that one. I've been called the Dread Facilitator Miller before as well. The Shredder of Business Models. Hopefully you won't see too much of that shredding today. Hopefully you will actually. Um, but uh, in all seriousness, professionally, I help startups find traction. That's what I do. So as Laura mentioned, I host a, a, a co-host a podcast with Cameron Law called Zero to Traction. Our second episode, it's a new podcast. Our second episode drops tomorrow. Um, that's uh, with a startup called EcoMap. So check that out. That's my billboard adjacent to me here is the Zero to Traction podcast, um, as well as a, a bunch of other things. If you happen to find me interesting, I don't know why you would, but if you do, then uh, that's the URL you can check out, jdm.bio. But that's not what we're here. We're not here to talk about me. We're here to talk about pitch. So here's what we're going to talk about. So we're going to uh, be kind of high level with a lot of this because I know for a lot of you, this is going to be uh, new material. And I, judging by the names in the, in the chat, I know some of you have some have a bit of experience with this, but, for, but uh, I, I want to make sure that those of you who are still earlier on in the process get a lot of value out of this. Um, and for the rest of you, it's probably going to be a, a good uh, refresher. So uh, yeah, we got some things to go through. But uh, before we kind of go uh, too far into this, I'm ask a question, drop your answer in the chat. What's the biggest problem with your pitch? Just throw throw it right on right on into the chat. Let's get some get some little popcorn happening here. Don't write me novels. We don't get got that kind of kind of time now. Just go ahead and drop what you think your your biggest problem with your pitches. Okay, so we got some good stuff here. We've got uh, visuals, balancing, level of detail, stuff like that, finances, content. <laughs> yes, hopefully something more specific than that. But yes, the content. All right, great. Uh, haven't started a deck. That's great. Um, traction. Traction is a problem in the in the in the deck. Um, so that's cool. Um, awesome. Uh, investor ROI, a weak point in the in the deck. What def def is required? Yeah, that's a good one. I don't know what to cut to make it shorter. That's a that's a common thing here uh, here too. And time consuming when working on traction. Yes, uh, pitching is time consuming. Uh, you are you are absolutely right, June. Okay, cool. Yeah, so that's all that's all good stuff. So I'm actually gonna I'm gonna kind of be a little bit contrarian here, and I'm gonna say something that is just absolutely offensive. And uh, having knowing not most of you here, uh, I, I fully say that, and I apologize in advance. But I think probably for most of you, the biggest problem with your pitch is actually that you are just not fundable yet. Probably, um, this is the most of the time when people are struggling with their deck, when they're trying to figure out how to put this in in into context and figure out what goes on my business model slide. The problem isn't the layout. The problem isn't the pitch. The problem is that you're not ready to pitch for funding yet. Um, that's not universally true. Of course, people are raising money all the time, but I do want to plant this seed in the, in the back of your mind that there is the possibility that you're raising at a time when you shouldn't be. And because pitching takes so much time, you really want to consider whether or not that's the most efficient use of your time. As I like to say, don't uh, you know, focus less on trying to get funding from an investor and instead focus on getting funding from your customer. Now, that's not what we're here to talk about today, um, so, but I do want to just plant that seed into, into the background. And so when we talk about this concept of uh, fund uh, fundability and what it means to be fundable. We're asking the question of fundamentally, what are investors looking for? So uh, I imagine you guys have got some ideas there. Drop in the chat. What do you think investors are looking for? What are some of the, the kinds of things? Judging by your responses so far, it looks like traction uh, and investor ROI. It sounds like you've got some of that stuff in there as well. 
um, yeah, uh, ROI, ROI. So yeah, so um, and uh, scale team, uh, good ones as well. Um, yeah, so what what is it profit, of course, right? And, and any investors looking for that. And when they're looking to evaluate whether or not this is a good investment, when they're whether or not looking to evaluate whether or not they're getting an ROI, what do you think they're looking for? Traction and team, honesty. Honesty is a good one. That's not set enough, but character character matters for sure, June. Um, immediate revenue accrual. Okay, that deserves uh, an elaboration. Uh, maybe we'll get to that in the Q&A. The market, uh, yeah, it's good stuff. Looking for that. If I were to summarize what I think that investors are looking for, trustworthiness, yeah, so keep keep dropping those in, in the chat. Love that stuff. Um, if I were to, to summarize, I would use Alex Blumberg's definition. As he says, they're looking for a credible theory of hugeness. And I've uh, put footnotes for all three of those because those words are doing a lot of heavy lifting. So I'm going to break these down in reverse order. But investors are looking for a credible theory of hugeness. So taking in reverse order, hugeness is scale. So in order to get that return on investment for something that is really, really risky, this has to be something that has the potential to scale really large. We're not looking for you know, 10%, 15%, 20% returns on investment. We're looking for 10x returns on investment. For those of you who, are, uh, who aren't good at math, that's a thousand percent return on investment, right? We're looking for really, really massive returns because startups are very risky. When you're doing early capital, for example, in an investor portfolio, you're going to make, you know, say 10 bets in a year or something like that. Of those 10 bets, you know, six of them are just going to kind of fail. A uh, couple of them will, you know, so you lost your money. A couple of them will kind of break even and so that's fine, but it wasn't worth it. But you need the one that's going to actually get just absolutely massive and cover the rest of the portfolio. It's going to cover the spread. And so if you're not pitching for that scale, then that's that's an issue. So the first thing you're looking for is that scale. So in a credible theory of hugeness, you have to have the hugeness. But you also, because you're not big now, you have to have a theory about how you're going to get huge. You're small now, how are you going to get huge? So what is our plan to go from where we are to there? And one of the biggest weaknesses that I see in pitch decks uh, or it just in startup pitches generally is that they just completely lack a theory about how they're going to get there. It's like, we've got this amazing idea and give us money and we'll figure out the rest, right? Uh, that's that's not that's not right. This is where go-to-market and, and other things come into place. Like how are you going to get from where you are now to this really big state? So that's a theory of hugeness. But the last part is that it has to be a credible theory of hugeness. Uh, and that's doing, a, the, the word credible is kind of doing a lot of lifting there. But at the end of the day, we're looking for evidence. And so you guys dropped a lot of this right into the chat. So we're looking for the, the total addressable market. So I'm going to give like the seven T's or eight T's uh, that I think investors are looking for in this kind of thing. And a lot of this will depend on your stage. So if you're doing a, you know, an angel round, like a pre-seed round, then your evidence is going to look a bit different than if you're doing a series A raise. Those are very, very different um, stages, but it's going to be some combination of these eight things, the total addressable market or the TAM, right? You have to have that again, that big market that you're going after. Think, you know, a market above a billion dollars. Like we're looking for really big market. The timing has to be right to attack that market, right? So timing's great for AI right now. That's pretty fantastic. Timing right now is terrible for crypto. So, right. What is the timing right in the market for you to, to catch that rising wave? You don't want to have to be the first one to market. The first one to market gets bloody. Do you have the right team who can execute on this? Do you have uh, the the technology? And that doesn't literally mean technology, but do you have the uh, do you have IP, the secret sauce that's going to help you get this done? Do you have traction already from customers that's saying yes, this is the, the, this is there's a there there, and we can kind of go after it? Do you have the ability to do 10x returns? Right. So can you can you actually get to those big returns inside of uh, inside of that total adjustable market? Are you working on something that's transformative? And are the terms of the deal right? So, like those are the those are the eight T's roughly. So, TAM, timing, team, technology, traction, ten X, transformative, or transformation, and and terms. Uh, those are those are the eight things. So, you have to have that theory has to be credible. Those are all different ways of showing that not only do you have this this ability to get huge, that you have a theory about how you're going to get there, but that theory makes sense and is credible. So, credible theory of hugeness. That's what an investor is looking for. So, the rest of this talk is going to be entirely about how you get to that credible theory of hugeness. Uh, or re not rather how you get to it, but how you how you talk about it. So let's uh, start, as I said, with some pitching myths, uh, because I want to just get these out of the way so that the rest of this conversation just makes a bit more sense. So first myth is that uh, pitching to an angel investor is like Shark Tank. It's nothing like Shark Tank. And when you talk about Shark Tank, usually investors will roll their eyes. Some of them get offended um, because it's nothing like that in the real world. 
Um, Shark Tank isn't like Shark Tank. They, you, you're seeing, I don't know, what is it? Three, five minutes or something like that. But it's like an hour conversation that they're in there that producers have edited down to three to five minutes. So it's not even an accurate representation of what really happened. But also it leads you to a bunch of wrong conclusions about what the point of investment is and what the point of an investor pitch is. So just take that Shark Tank thing out of in your head and just completely set it aside completely discard it. Everything that you learn from Shark Tank is wrong. And some of this is covered by the other myths. So let's move on that you are pitching for investment. So that's the right? we're talking to investors. This must be an investor pitch. I'm pitching for investment. And that's actually not true. What you're pitching for is a second meeting. So you go in front of them and you give your pitch and you get the you know 20 minutes or whatever to pitch. And then you get questions and everything else. The outcome of that conversation is not a check. The outcome of that conversation is the is an invite to another meeting, and that's what you're going for. You're going for the level of credibility and the level of information to say that this is an investment that is worth further conversation. That's the point of the pitch. And when you're in a room and you're pitching to, say, 20 investors, that's obviously the point because what you're getting you, when you walk up stage is you want people to walk up to you and have that further conversation. So keep that other thing in mind, is that you're not looking to get a check from the from the deck. You're looking to get another meeting. So keep that in mind as well. Another myth is that your pitch should be original. I did a, a, a whole thing on this recently on, on one of my other uh, podcasts on, on TikTok. You, uh, so it sounds like my, is my audio cutting out a bit? Laura? It, it did for, uh, I don't know, maybe 15 seconds or so, but it's been okay for a while. Okay. Uh, if that happens again, uh, there's something I can try. So just let me know. Okay. okay. Um, all right. My apologies. Okay, so a lot of people think that like, oh, I want to stand out and I want to be original, um, but you actually don't because pitches are patterns. They they follow a certain pattern and somebody who hears a lot of pitches. So for example, me, I'm, I'm narrowing in on about 2000 pitches. I'm getting close to 2000 pitches I've heard. And when you hear that many pitches, it become formulaic. And we listen for things in a certain order in a specific, specific pattern. And when you break outside that pattern, you create cognitive burden for those of us who are listening. We have to now do more processing to put your pitch in the context of the of what we're used to hearing. And when we do that, it's A, frustrating, and B, we actually miss some information. So don't you don't try to go original with your pitch. Your startup, yeah. Your pitch, no. Your pitch should follow the template, should follow the format, and you don't want to break too much out of that because it almost never works. Happy to talk more about that in, in Q&A. Next myth is that people invest in ideas. And this is what it seems like from Shark Tank. They say, Yo, I, you know, I have this thing and this is really cool. They go, oh, yes, this is going to be big, mate. Let's invest in this. And no, that's just not the way that it that it works at all. People do not invest in ideas. You saw that tam, that uh, you know, team, TAM, timing, you know, technology, terms, that traction. There's all that kind of stuff that they're actually looking for. So they're investing in those credible theories, right? And that's idea plus the evidence plus the team to back that up. Nobody's investing in an idea. Your idea isn't worth shit. Sorry. And again, with the number of pitches that I hear, uh, I hear the same ideas all the time. Your idea, I've probably heard before. Or some very close variation of your idea, I've probably heard before. And if you want to challenge me on that, challenge me on that. I will bet of the 32 people here in the room right now that I've heard 29 of those pitches before. So, or something similar to them. And that's fantastic. That's not bad right? Because it all comes down to the execution, but it just means nobody invests time in ideas or nobody invests money in ideas. All right. And our last myth is that you're going to just pitch a few times and you'll get the right investors. You know, you got connected with the network and you'll get your investment. If you are well connected in the Silicon Valley, this is true. Um, but if in the real world for the rest of us, this is not true. You, you're going to pitch a hundred times to get your checks. To get your first round, you're going to pitch a hundred times. You're going to have a CRM set up with the names of investors all in there and met and doing statuses for everybody and like tracking them through and pipeline management. It's it's a whole thing. That's why it takes so much time is because you're not looking to pitch to two, three, four, five people. You're looking to pitch to a hundred people because you have to have that right combination of their interest in this plus the learning and practice that you get from it has to match their thesis, has to match their temperament and stage and everything else as well. So yes, thank you for adding the clarification, Laura. When I say well-connected in Silicon Valley, I meant that those connections came through the past success. Um, so uh, I know people, for example, who can like, uh, 
the who who have had like a hundred plus million in exits, and they can just like they they don't live in California. They'll fly out to the valley. They'll have you know they'll have a, a coffee, uh, a, you know two coffees, and then breakfast and or a brunch and uh, lunch and maybe a dinner and they will have their their first you know their round raised you know for 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 one or 1.5 or something like that because they have all that credibility behind them um and they have all the network and relationships to do that but the, even those people still do the CRM thing they still have all these people that they're going to reach out to and do all that so um cool all right so now that we've got some myths out of the way let's focus on the structure of the pitch what actually goes into the pitch this is going to go through this pretty fast this is guy kawasaki's 10 20 30 rule so it's easy to remember and what it stands for are 10 slides 20 minutes 30 point font and what this means is that you're again standard structure 10 slides um it might be 12 slides right something like that but 10 slides is what you're going for. 10 slides is the pattern that we follow. It's how we're used to hearing things. Um, so you're going to want to, to stick with that structure. I'm actually going to go over those 10 slides in the next section. So we'll kind of set that aside. Uh, 20 minutes. So if you're if you're invited to pitch for an hour, and this is not always the case. In fact, it's oftentimes a lot less than that. But let's say you're invited to uh, pitch for an hour. You're going to want to spend no more than 20 minutes doing your actual pitch. And that's for a couple of reasons. One, you need plenty of time for questions. If they don't have questions or they don't get their questions answered, those are both bad signs. If they don't have questions, it means that they you, you already lost them. They're not interested at all and that sucks. But if they have questions and they don't get to answer them, um, for because they're for for time, that's also not great because then they're going to be left with whatever conclusion they already formed, which might actually not even be accurate. The other reason that you want to stick to 20 minutes is that shit happens. <laughs> you're going to have trouble with the HDMI cables and everything else. And you just want to make sure that so you plan if you're doing an hour with a, with investors, you're going to want to to keep that down to, to 20 to 20 minutes. Um, and so from, from the chat, what about five minute pitches? Yeah. So in uh, five minute pitches are, are five minutes. Like that's what you want to, that's what you want to do. Usually if you have a five minute pitch, it's five minutes plus some additional time for Q and A. So you want to stick with the format. Uh, for example, we have our weekly 1 million cups, which I'll tell you about at the end for those of you who aren't familiar, but with 1 million cups, we have two presenters every week get six minutes. That's an odd number, but they get six minutes to talk about what they're working on. And then we get 15 to 20 minutes as an audience of their peers to ask questions. When we do um, competitions, those can look really different as well. Laura and I and Cameron just did a, a competition a weekend before last and the pitches were three minutes. You got to stick within whatever format and constraints that you have. And when you, if you're great question. So if you're, if the slides are what you're concerned about, how many slides do I have? If you're doing a five minute pitch, you can do 10 slides. You're just going to go into a lot less depth. Um, if you're doing a three minute pitch, 10 slides is probably too many. But uh, so you're going to have to play it by ear a little bit, but it's still the same structure, even if you're not doing that. And this is where the last one, the 30 plus point font really comes into play because when, uh, if you have any font that's smaller than 30, you're putting too much work or sorry, too much text onto the slide. And it's going to be very difficult for us to actually, actually follow. So, um, when you do that, when you are putting text on your slide, you want to stick with the, what's the one takeaway that you want them to have and put it in 30 point font right on the slides. You don't need more than that. You can talk around the rest of it and that's fine. So for example, this slide here is a good example of that 10 slides, 20 minutes, 30 point font. You're going to remember that. And I've been talking about it for a little bit. I've, I've spent, you know, the last about 90 seconds talking about this one, this, this one piece of information. And there's all kinds of information. You remember different parts of the parts you're going to remember is 10, 20, 30. That's what I want you to remember. That's why it's on the slide. And that's how you should rock it too. So if you're if you're going back to the question, if you're doing a really short pitch, if you're doing like a five or six minute pitch, that's even more important because the slide's just going to literally be up for less time on the screen. So you don't want to give them a lot to process. Charts and graphs and things like that can really get in your way. A lot of text can really get in the way. So 10, 20, 30, keep that in mind. Okay. And then Laura added some clarification to the chat. So you can feel free to check that out as well. All right, so 10, 20, 30, keep your, follow the structure of 10 slides, keep it in for an hour pre, for an hour with a of an investor, keep your pitch to 20 minutes or less, probably less, and then don't use any font that is smaller than 30 points. So let's talk about the 10 slides that you need for your, um, it, for your investor pitch. And so, uh, Victor, like a three minute pitches are like, are, are much longer than an elevator pitch. Uh, your, your elevator pitch is typically something like 15 to 45 seconds. They're really, really fast. And that's where you have, you know, and in 15 seconds, you have uh, usually two robust sentences for an elevator pitch, you know, one main point and three supporting points to kind of get you there. And then, um, if, so three minutes, you can actually cover all of the content that you would ordinarily have in a 20 minute pitch. You just have to keep it really shallow. 
That's the that's the distinction in time. It's not that you necessarily cut out information uh, or buckets. It's that you make those buckets a lot more shallow. You just can't go in as much depth. Okay, so let's talk about the 10 slides. Um, so we're just gonna go kind of straight straight through these, right? So first slide, the introduction slide. This is the one that has your logo, maybe a tagline. It's maybe got your name as the person who's up there giving the pitch. And this is the basic premise of like, literally just who the heck are you? Like, what, what are you doing up here? And th this is where uh, honestly, a lot of founders just fall right on their face, right out the gate because the, the first words out of your mouth, and I'm saying that for emphasis with my clapping of hands, it needs to be what your business does. It's what we often call your X, Y, right? We are this for that, or we help X with Y. Uh, and that's because we need context. When we when you go through and talk about the problem and customer and the market and you're doing all this stuff, we need context for how to hear what you're saying. A lot of founders really like to do this um, like big reveal. So they'll be like, oh, there's all these people out there and they got this really big problem and it's really terrible and introducing. And then they'll they'll like throw up their, their solution to that. Well, the problem is that we now have to go, once you tell us the solution, we have to go back and reprocess everything that you told us about the problem. Whereas if you just give us these literally like six seconds up front of this is what we are, this is what we're doing right on the introduction, right from the top, then we know how to process the rest of the information and you can come back to more detail when you get to your, actually, uh, to your solution slide at the end. Yes, these slides will be available. Um, so introduction, basically that's it, right? Who are you? Move on. Okay, now we got that, but second is the problem or, or also known as the, the opportunity. So this is where you tell us a little bit about the customer. You tell us how many are out there. What's the size of the problem in the market? What's motivating them um, to, to, to try to, to, to want a solution to this problem and so forth, right? So the, what's the problem for whom it has that problem? Like who's the customer? What do they look like? And that all translates to our opportunity problems or opportunities, right? Like an entrepreneur is a guy who walks down around the street. I'm using guy in the gender neutral sense is, is a, is a dude who walks down the street, sees a problem and says, I could make money at that. That's an entrepreneur, right? So you have to tell us about it. You have to tell us about who is a customer, how many of them are out there? What do they look like? Why is this problem really se severe and urgent? And you're not going to have, again, very much content on this slide, but you're going to be talking about it, you know, for one to two minutes. So it's, there's going to be some story here around why this is a big problem to them. And we're going to come back to the story aspect in a little bit, uh, but let's just get through the actual slides themselves. So the third slide is the value prop side. So now that you've identified a problem, you have to say what the value is that addresses that problem statement. And this is not the same thing as your solution. Sometimes it is, but the value prop that you're offering is the saving of time or the easing of pain. And there's a mechanism you do that. And the mechanism is the solution. That's like your app or your service or whatever. But these actual value prop to customers is what solves their pain. That's what they see is like, I use this because. So this is where you want to focus on that and talk about how you're helping those customers who have you just identified have this really big, severe, urgent problem that they need addressed. So you want to dive into the value proposition there and talk about that. Next, we have the secret sauce, right? So this is, or the IP or, or technology or whatever it is that you, that you want to call this, but this is the actual solution side of this. So therefore we have this app that, or we did this device that has patent pending and blah, blah, blah. This is where you talk about what exactly the value, how you're exactly going about the process of delivering that value proposition that you just identified. And more than that, uh, more than that, how is this is this defensible? At least on the surface, how are we defending this? If you if you're really early on, that's probably less interesting. If you're at the seed stage, it's interesting. If you're at Series A, it's super interesting. So that's kind of where how you want to think about defensibility there, right? It's like how are you gonna um, how are you gonna you know really get to the the how are you gonna create that value? How are you gonna deliver that to customers? Uh, that was a, it's a terrible thing when, when bad things happen to good sentences, as just as you just witnessed. Uh, okay, so question from the Christmas chat. If the, a lot of the content is said verbally, how are projects judged when submitted online? Okay, I'm going to come back to that in a minute once we get through these slides, but that's a really good question. All right, so after you have that, so we've talked about the problem, we talked about the, the solution and value proposition and how we're delivering that here. Next is like really how we, how we go and make money. 
That's what we really care about, right? So that's where you talk about the business model. Um, and this is a, a number of different questions that all have to be articulated at once as simply and cleanly as possible. It's from whom are you taking money? How are you taking that money? What is the dollar amount of the money that you're taking? Why is that going to make money in the long run? Because there's enough people out there because you're getting it with regularity, right? Like it's a SaaS model and so it's subscription-based and it's recurring or is it the, it's a razors and blades model or how is that going to really, you know, how is that going to work, right? Why does this make money at the end of the day? There's a lot of information buried in that. One of my favorite examples of that, I should have actually included it here, uh, are the all the remakes that people have done of Airbnb's deck. And I can drop that into the chat afterward, but the uh, Airbnb's pitch deck had three circles on it. And in those three circles, it just gave their three, their three important numbers. That was how they were going to make a lot of money. So just if you Google Airbnb pitch deck, you'll find that in there and it's, it's nice and simple, or I can drop it in the chat a little bit later. Um, but again, to go over those questions, you know, when you're talking about business model, we're talking about from whom are you taking money? what are I like, how, how are you collecting that money? What's the money that you're collecting, right? And why does that make money in the long run? All of that is part of this business model, business model question. So you want to put this as simple as possible. One of the common mistakes of a business model slide is that it gets, it's bullets and it's a lot of text and it's all dense and it's hard to follow and there's no clear story. And this is, as you can imagine, one of the most important parts of your pitch deck. If you guys all talk about ROI before, the ROI comes in the business model or at least part of it comes in the business model. So you got to really ground into that, okay? Business model. Moving on. Once you have these customers from your solving some pain, you have a go-to-market, et cetera, et cetera, um, or once you have a business model, now it's time to talk about go-to-market. So the, I'm going to say this by contrasting, for those of you who aren't familiar, go-to-market with marketing because they are not the same thing. They are actually basically diametrically opposed to each other. Right? So go-to-market and marketing are not the same thing. And what I mean by that is that while go-to-market uses marketing tactics, it emphatically does not use marketing strategy. So go-to-market strategy and marketing strategy are two very different things. So an example of marketing strategy, so I can say this by contrast, is that you know we're, a marketing strategy is we I know our customers are Instagram, we're going to partner with influencers, and we are going to uh, create, you know, do some Instagram ads, drive to, drive to the landing page, and then optimize for conversion on that side reasonable marketing plan um, uh, or a, a 30,000 foot view plan was probably too strong, but reasonable, a reasonable strategy. As they go to market, it's shit. It's terrible. It's awful. It's awful, awful, awful. And it's awful for a couple of reasons. The first reason is that it's very, very, very generic. It's very like hand wavy. Um, and it just, it does that. And even if you start getting more specific and you start talking about, okay, what's our cost, you know, our customer acquisition cost, how much is it going to actually cost to get a click on this thing? And then what's it going to cost to actually convert them at the end? And was that transit? Even if you have data on that, which if you're, in, you know, basically in the seed stage or earlier, you probably don't have any information on that. Then um, it's just, you're just making shit up and saying, we'll figure it out later. And that's just not very worthwhile. The second reason it really sucks is that you're also saying that you're going to buy your first customers. Like the way you're going to go get your early customers, the early adopters is actually just to go pay for them, which kind of is a red flag because they're, it's only going to get more expensive as you go along. And so you're already starting out the gate by spending a ton of money. So marketing doesn't really work super well in this context. Go to market by contrast is about efficiency. How are you going to efficiently reach customers when you don't, when you, when you have limited time, limited money and no brand recognition. And so this is where companies will make the mistake of trying to say like, we're going to go after getting brand recognition. We're going to go build our brand. We're going to go do awareness campaigns. And like, that's all really expensive and it's all late market stuff. The early market stuff here is like getting super hacky and finding out, you know what, there's this channel over here where there's all these customers that we can get in front of them and we can get in front of them like crazy easily and just throw this message out there and see if we can get responses. That's the kind of uh, go to market strategy you're looking at it. It's this 10x thing. It's where's what customer one coming from, then what customer 10, then customer 100, customer 1000. Now, I gave you all of that information knowing full well that that has nothing to do with actually building your pitch deck. That's just the work of the startup and finding go to market. But I say it because so often go to market slides are just filled with these generic marketing strategies and nobody's putting their money into that. You've got to have a plan that says how exactly you're going to efficiently reach those early customers. Because if you're having to buy them, if you're having to do marketing, you've already lost. 
right? So how are you really efficiently doing that? And we can come back to that in more specific when we get time for, uh, for Q&A. Okay, so now that you have uh, this, this business that you've identified with a customer whose problem you're solving and you say how you're going to get it to market, you're not the only one in market. So you got to talk about your competition. And this is where it's important to, ref to, to call out that competition and competitor are not the same thing. So competitors are one kind of competition, but you have other kinds of competition as well. And if you don't have a lot, a deep understanding of who your competitors are, of who the competing products are, that's a big red flag. Um, and it's also just a, it's a death knell for your startup anyway. But more than that, let's say you don't have any direct competitors. Let's say that nobody's doing exactly what you're doing. Well, Somebody out there is doing something that some customers out there are trying to do instead to solve this problem. The if you're pro solving a problem worth solving, customers are doing something to try to solve it. If you're solving a problem and customers are not trying to solve it at all right now, you are not solving a problem worth starting. You are worth solving. You are not on the right track. There's not a there there. All right, at least not in the short term. Um. So what you want to do is find out what are customers doing that is not you to try to solve this problem. How much money are they spending on that, right? Are they, are, that's one way you can talk about competition is that our, our particular customer segment, our niche is spending X dollars trying to solve this problem, right? It could be that they're, they're doing this and that, and, but they don't really match you know, what we're trying to do in our unique value proposition. That's where you see the X, Ys, right? Where you draw like differentiator one, differentiator two, and then you're up here all by your lonesome, I guess it's on this side, all by your lonesome in the, in the upper uh, right quadrant of, uh, of the graph there all by yourself because you called out how you're different than all of the competition, et cetera. But if you're going here and you, and you start saying you don't have any competition, investors have already decided no. You can't say you have no competition because you either do or you're not solving a problem worth solving. Okay. Um, can I go into more detail of that? Because a lot of examples of what not to do, what not to do. I assume that was in reference to the go-to-market, uh, judging by the, the timestamp of the, of the comment, but let me know if I'm wrong there. And then yes, the answer is, is yes, we can talk about that. But the um, just to give the, the surface answer here is I can't tell you what to do because your go-to-market plan is going to look different for every single company. That's why it's focused on what you don't want to do. Um, but this is going that your go to market is going to have, um, uh, let me uh, make up a company and then tell you what that might look like. So to let's say we have a, I'll just use an easy example. Let's say it's a food truck. You're doing a food truck business. Um, and this is like your, your way of uh, doing a new restaurant concept, but we're going to do a food truck, try a new kind of fusion food to serve a particular area, see if that worth worthwhile. Um, so, um, so, okay, so that's our, that's our thing here. Well, we've already teased part of the go-to-market is that we have this big vision for something much broader. We have this big vision for how we want to do this new restaurant fusion that's going to serve this particular area. One of the ways we're going to market is through a food truck. So we're not jumping straight to the restaurant. We're going to the food truck first, getting customers there. That'll give us the validation we need to open a restaurant. So that's number one. But number two is now we say, okay, what's our, what, how are we going to go to market again? Think 10X, right? One, 10, 100, 1,000. So how do we get in front of the food truck in front of customers? Well, the way we're going to get you know, people using this is we're going to go to these particular se underserved sectors. Like there's these places where all these people hang out around lunchtime and there's a dearth of options for, for lunch there. Nobody's, nobody's serving them right now. There aren't a bunch of food trucks there. A lot of the restaurants that are in the area are sit down. They take a long time. And based, based on, based on you know, our research, these people really want something faster. And it's every single day. You know, it's five days a week that we get this thing. So that's how we're going to go to market. It's like we're going to actually get out there in front of these customers to do that. And then our next step is that's the kind of thing that you're talking about. It's how you actually going from where you are now to going in a market in a really, really efficient way. Again, that'll look 100% different based on what your, what your startup is. Um, it could be based on relationships. It could be based on um, the... Uh, It could be based on a niche that you've been able to identify that's really underserved, that's very difficult, or that's uh, very easy to get in front of, right? As that's part of a larger market that's difficult to get in front of um, because they're all attending the same types of conferences, right? So you might be going to conferences to get these things. Uh, a, a friend of mine has a startup that's doing really well right now, and they get like just crazy high conversion rates when they go to conferences. Makes sense. Um, so things like that, like, it's how are we actually going to efficiently get in front of customers? So some, um, so I, yeah, like guerrilla marketing. Yeah. I don't like the term guerrilla marketing for this, uh, because to me, 
guerrilla marketing, and this might not be what you're saying at all, Rodney, but like for me, guerrilla marketing conveys a um, really risky approach, right? So we're going to do something crazy and attention seeking to see if it will work. Now, the guerrilla warfare is not like that, right? Guerrilla warfare is, you know, is about using your your size as an, your small, your relatively small size as an advantage. Um, it's asymmetric warfare. And in that case, I 100% agree. So if we're talking about that, then I absolutely focus on that um, as opposed to uh, as opposed to like the, the the crazy, like, let's just see if we can get some crazy plan to work. You know, if you're a go to market plan, actually, some of the the probably, I don't know, maybe the second or third most common go to market strategy I see in a, in a slide deck that is also one of the worst go to market strategies ever is they'll say, we're going to, we're going to create content on social media and we're going to get popular. Um, and the reason why that, that is so bad is uh, like, there's, is the old, is the old joke that like, there's a startup founder and, you know, she, she's got this, uh, this business, this product already in market customers love it. Uh, but she, you know, she doesn't have any way of getting in front of new customers. And she realizes all of her customers on Twitter are on Twitter. So then she goes and creates a Twitter account. Now she's got two startups. Right. Because building an audience is really freaking hard. So you've just signed up to do a whole other business of audience building uh, in, in addition to trying to build a business. It's just not a good idea. Um, so like, and again, that's so it's probably the second or third most common go to market strategy I see for pre seed startups. And it's also the worst. You, your, your chances of success there are so abysmal. So, so very bad. I agreed, Marcia. So very bad. Um, just not good. Uh, not at all good. All right. Um, so there. Oh, so then we talk about competition. Don't ignore your competition. This, you, like you gotta, you gotta know who your customers are are, are using, and you gotta be able to articulate who they are, um, how much they're spending on them, how much time they're spending on them, or what the appropriate metric is, and why you're better, why you're different, why are they going to choose you? Why are you so much better than the competition that you can overcome switching costs? So this goes back to the existing problems that people have. Those problems are 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 stuff that aren't super well addressed by the competition. And therefore that creates an opportunity for us, that kind of thing. All right, 70% of the way through here, let's move on. Uh, 80 or eight, eight in the 80th percentile here, we have team. So this is where, you know, who are you and why do you matter and why should we trust you? <laughs> it's all of that. Um, and it's not just the people who are, say, the co-founders, although that is important. That's obviously most important to your co-founders. But this is also where you can say things like strategic partnerships or advisors um, that you've been able to collect along the way, because these are other people out there who, who you can, whose credibility you can borrow. So if you get like a senior VP at Microsoft with deep experience in this particular field and they've decided to be an advisor on your team, that's pretty cool, right? Um, that's it, borrowed credibility and that can go a long way as well. So who are all the key players in here? Again, when you get to series A, this is one of the most important things that you're gonna have along with the traction. Seed is this is gonna be pretty important, but the evidence is, is murkier. When you're in pre-seed, you might even be solo, you might be you know, a couple of, uh, you know, you and a, and a co-founder or two along the way. So who have you been able to collect along the way that can do credibility in that? Um, and I completely agree with Laura, trying to get funding without co-founders is, is uh, super, super hard. So, and it's actually getting harder. Um, there are a lot more um, like accelerator programs and so forth that are actually just denying companies that only, that don't have co-founders. Uh, it's just getting harder because um, competitions uh, stew to ship. Yeah. Cameron put it well, who's going to, who's going to steer the ship, <laughs> right? Who's going to, who's going to drive this boat. Um, and then Victor, you asked, uh, how do you win my approval? I don't know. Many have tried, few have succeeded, but uh, I encourage you all to keep, to keep at it. All right, the ninth slide, financials. Um, uh, what does a bottom-up forecast for three years look like? So if you're really early on, financials are all bullshit, don't include them. But as you're further along and you stay, if you're at, like, if you're at series A, the financials are gonna be really important. If you're at C, they're pointing in the right direction, hopefully. Um, when you're at pre-seed, you may not have any financials at all, or your financials might be really like crappy. And so like doing a three-year pro form is not very interesting. So this is this is for companies to a little bit further along, but there should be some component of evidence here from the marketplace. And so if you're giving a really early stage investor pitch, like say pre-seed, your financials actually might be things that are more like other evidence of buying behavior, the LOIs you've been able to get that kind of thing. But if you're like giving a series A pitch, like you, you better damn well have like a really good understanding. This is what it costs to our customer acquisition. This is what, uh, this is what the switching cost is. And here's how we overcome that. And then, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot that you've got going on there. Um, yeah. 
Um, cool. And I think there was a question in the chat here. Yeah, uh, which Laura answered well, so I will just leave that uh, as is. Okay, and then lastly, the tenth slide is the is the ask. So this, uh, if you're pitching to an investor, a pitch is to pitch for something. So for what are you pitching? This might be uh, if you're you know pitching for capital. This is this is going to be the, the exact amount that you're looking to raise, not from this one investor, but this is the size of the round. What's your progress in like how much of that round is 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 still open or closed? Um, and then exactly like how, what does that mean in terms of what you're working on. So you could have terms in here as well, um, meaning like the 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 actual uh, like the vehicle, you know, is it a safe, for example, is um are you know what is the um the the equity, the valuation. There's other things that might go into and in to this as well. They'll definitely be part of the conversation either way. Um, but aside from that, the a really important thing and part of the ask is the use of funds. So you're asking this money in order to do what? So what is that going to get them at the end of the day? And the this investment, usually, even if you're in the Series A stage, but definitely you're through the pre-seed and seed stage, the money that you're getting usually doesn't get you to profitability. It usually doesn't get you to the ROI. What they're looking for is how you're getting to your next raise, how you get into your next round with your company increasing in value. Um, so like we're, this is going to give us an 18 month runway and uh, at which time we'll raise our Series A, like something like that, right? This is, this is what we're trying to do with that. That's how that works. Uh, the ask is for my approval. That's right. That's right. But uh, aim, aim a little lower, aim, aim a little lower. Um, okay. Um, a suggestion for an 11th slide, investor highlights summarizing why they should invest, unique features of the company, people, market, technology, et cetera, uh, six to eight key points. Um, yeah, so uh, depending on on who you're pitching to, and we'll get this to a minute, some things like that might be uh, might be interesting or or might not be. They're going to depend a lot on, on context, investor thesis, and so forth. Um, and there's a difference also if you're trying to... Um, uh, you know, give a uh, a deck over over the wire, like you email them a deck or submit it on their website, where you're gonna have a little bit more detail than the deck that you're just pitching to live. Um, those like that may not make a lot of sense there to to talk about those things, but it, you know, as a part of the the other communications, it makes a lot more sense. Another question: uh, How about a slide on exit strategy? I wouldn't. Um, Nineteen times out of twenty, I would not do that. Uh, for a, I'll give you the reason why you would in a second. But the the uh, the reason why most of them you don't want to put in a, an exit slide, in my opinion, is that the ants that your strategy is going to be lame and um, probably not very useful. And if it is useful to the investor, they're not an investor you want to work with. And here's why: so most of the time, your exit strategy is either going to be an IPO or or some type of acquisition, right? Okay. But an investor knows that that's why they put money into these companies is hoping for an IPO or hoping for an acquisition. So you're really not telling them anything. Josh, your sound is. Josh. And if that's news to the that you're pitching, you really don't want that investor involved in company. Um, it's, just, it's just not very interesting. Are you holding a mother? I believe I may have frozen there. So I'm pausing for a second. Your sound was pretty wacky for, I don't know, maybe 20 seconds. The, oh, uh-oh, he's gone. I hope I don't have to teach this. Let's see, he will likely- I am back now. Oh, you're back, okay. Let's see, I need to find you. Oh, there you are. I am, but I'm actually going to, re I'm actually going to reconnect. Um, so I apologize, uh, just give me about, about 30 seconds. Um, to to reconnect uh, because I, I Zoom is doing something weird. One second. Okay. Operator error. So uh, some of you asked in the chat. We uh, we are recording this, and the video will be available in a blog post on our website uh, probably in a few days. <coughs> and Josh will also be <coughs> sharing his slides, and I'll be sending those to you. There he is. Can you hear me, Josh? Yeah, we should be good now. Okay. Um, um, me, all right. Uh, I need to make you co-host. Ah, yes. Thank you. Um, yeah, yes. Exit strategy. Ironic. I just planned my own. I didn't want to answer that question. Uh, so I left. Um, so I actually uh, did answer the question, but I don't know uh, how much of that uh, y'all y'all heard. Um, but uh, I'm a co-host. Okay, great. Um, if you guys remember back, I said 10, 20, 30, and I said, you want to plan for 20 because shit happens. 
there you go. Case in point, I was just making a demonstration of this, of this in action. Um, okay, so to, to quickly recap on the on the exit strategy thing, and then I'll share the slides again since I don't have a slide, I'll just wait a second. Um, so your exit strategy is either going to be like an IPO or an acquisition, and that's just not very interesting, like duh, right? That's why we invest in this. And so if you, to put that in there, you're either telling the investor you think they're dumb or your investor really is dumb, and in which case you're you don't want to work with them anyway. So like, I just don't think exit strategy adds value in almost every case. There are exceptions to that. So where you're doing something that is different and unexpected with your exit strategy, that is important. A uh, couple of examples. So one would be if you are aiming for a very quick exit. So if this is something that we're going to flip around, you know, right away, you know, next year, as opposed to like the usual cycle, um, and that therefore this is going to take a completely different strategy, then that's something that your investor needs to know about. And it's going to be important because it can actually change your, your short-term strategy. That's not very common. Uh, another example would be if you're making a play that's going to be very enticing to a big player in the space who you are also looking to get as a strategic partner. So that might be interesting to mention as well. So if you have early conversations with a big player in the market and they're very interested in this, um, then that might be something where we have this easy exit strategy where they're basically giving us a roadmap for if we get to this milestone, they'll just gobble us up and that's great. Um, so in those cases, it, it might make sense to call out because there's something there that's non-obvious. But if your exit strategy is, is uh, super obvious, um, don't, don't mention it because it's just insulting, um, either to you or to the investor. So uh, with that, I'm going to share that again. And we are back. I appreciate everyone's uh, grace with my technical uh, uh, technical difficulties there. Uh, how about explaining exits and valuations or similar companies? Yeah, I actually think that that can work. So if you're if you're actually just trying to articulate that there's a there there and that other companies have done something similar, then you can use the exits uh, either as evidence of timing or evidence of problem. There's a lot of ways that you can use that information to do it. But because you want to be doing something different, it's dangerous. And I know you're not implying this, but it would be dangerous to say something like, um, um like we can do this because they did, because you're trying to do something different or hopefully you're trying to do something different. Um, but yes, uh, mentioning similar exits uh, can actually be good evidence of, of other things. And yeah, we'll do uh, we'll do uh, verbal questions in a minute. We're actually, we don't have much more to go in the, in the talk. Um, okay, uh, so that's that. So let's move on. That was the 10 slides. So let's move on to the importance of storytelling, right? So storytelling is, is really important. And everybody says, oh, pitches are stories, pitches are stories. But one of the things that I want to call out is there's actually two stories in your pitch. And people often ignore one of them. Um, so let's kind of talk through those real quick. So the first is the story of the customer. This is where we get, meet Jane. Jane has this problem. Jane, blah, 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 blah. Then Jane uses our amazing product. And now Jane's life is amazing. Uh, that's great. That's a that's a good story. If done well inside of your pitch, that can be really powerful because stories resonate with people. Where people at the end of the day, anybody listening to your pitch is a person too. Uh, at least for now, AI hasn't taken over that yet. So um, uh, the, as they're hearing that, like those things can resonate well. You got to be careful. You're not taking up too much time or giving irrelevant information. But telling the story of the customers and and, and putting it into a person that that you can identify and point to uh, makes sense. It also helps with the conversation. It helps to talk about the customer uh, by by just using a name, by saying, well, see, the problem is when Jane tries to use competitor X, then what happens is, and so everything kind of lands a little bit better. So the story of the customer is really, really important and, and really interesting here. And this is hero's journey stuff. This is where the customer's the hero and you're the you know, the wizard, you know, that they meet along the way who's directing them, but the customer becomes the hero of their story and it's all that. So they're not your audience though, in this kind of pitch, right? The, the customer is not the one listening to it. Um, so they're, we're telling that story in order to help us talk about the there that's there. So when I talk about a story, um, when you and I are having a story uh, or, uh, talk, wow. Okay, starting that again, when I am talking about the story of the startup, most of the time I'm actually talking about uh, something completely different. And so I'm actually gonna do this by visualization. So let's go back, right on back. Hopefully nobody gets motion sick with that. All right, go back to uh, the this thing here, right? So there is a standard structure, a standard pattern we're used to hearing this. And I'm gonna take the entire pitch, this 10 slides, and I'm gonna compress it to less than 60 seconds so that you can see what I'm talking about here, okay? so. Here we go. All right. 
So we are amazing company. We are X for Y. There's this customer out there and they have this really big problem. And, you know, and, and Jane has this thing and there's a lot of Janes out there actually, and that creates an opportunity for us. And so we want to help Jane by blah, blah, blah. And we're going to do that because we have this really cool app that uh, allows us to X, Y, Z. And uh, we make money by charging Jane a monthly fee that costs blank, blank, blank. And we know it can grow to this kind of size market, but Jane can be kind of hard to get in front of. But the really cool thing is that we found this, this unique path of getting in front of a lot of Janes because blah, 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 blah. And Jane isn't really well served in the real world because uh, you know the, we have this other competition, but they kind of drop the ball in these particular ways. So that creates a really cool opportunity for us. And you know that we can kind of pull this off because not only do we have these cool co-founders in this background, but we got these amazing advisors kind of backing us up. And you know we've also got some evidence like that we're on the right track here in terms of the numbers. And here's kind of a hint about where we're going here. And all it's going to take from you is, right? So let's do great things together. That's the story of the startup. And so when we're talking about the, the uh, stories inside your pitch, make sure you're, you're like, this one here is optional. The story of the customer is optional. The story of the startup is not optional. If you fail on this point, you won't get funded. Um, and so the, the actually stringing together a story that makes sense, that is coherent, that is compelling, that is cohesive, that is cogent, and many other C words. Uh, that is the key to actually getting all this information across in a way that lets an investor go, yeah, let's talk about this. This seems like it could be an interesting investment. So that's what you're going for there, right? Story of the startup. That's all I'm going to say about storytelling because that is a whole big complicated topic um, that we just don't have time for in this. But keep in mind those two stories, the story of the customer and the story of the startup. Okay, so let's move on. Let's talk about pitch performance. So this is what everybody thinks is most important and it is important, but it is not most important. So this is where everybody thinks like, if you're just slick and you have this like veil, like a, um, what was it they said about uh, Steve Jobs, a reality distortion field or something like that, that helps, but it's not at the end of the day, you're not trying, you're not a used car salesman. You're not trying to talk somebody into buying a nice used Hyundai. You're trying to talk to a savvy person who knows what they're talking about and, and telling them why this is an interesting investment so that they want to opt in. So performance is secondary to everything else that we just talked about. Okay. So this is the big picture. The big picture is that pitching is not complicated. It just isn't. It's really hard. And for some people, it's going to be harder than others, but it's actually not very complicated. It's pretty straightforward. It's just really hard. So I'm going to give you a few tips. These are four things that I would recommend that you look at. So first is practice, 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 practice. You cannot practice enough. Five times is not enough times. You want to practice this over and over and over. And again, you're going to be pitching a hundred times. Like this is not, the, <laughs> you're going to be spending a lot of time doing this. It's going to get better. And when I say practice, when we're talking about that, that 15 seconds at the top, you know, or the, the six seconds that you say at the top are X, Y, we are X for Y, or we help this customer with that problem. Well, that thing can take a long time to get right. The first three, four, five times that or four or five iterations are probably not right. So this is where you want to pitch it to freaking everybody. You want to pitch it to your barista at the coffee shop. Like they'll say, oh, uh, you know, they're, they're nice people. Baristas are nice people. They are. So when uh, they say, um, how are you today? You, you say, I'm great. I'm just actually working on working on my startup today. They're nice. They're going to, and they work on tips. So their follow-up question will be, oh, what's your startup? Right? So this is when you give them that six seconds, be respectful of their time. But this is when you give them that six seconds and you can tell by their face, you can tell by their eyes, you can tell by their follow-up whether or not it landed with them at all. And landed with them is very different than they found it interesting. Those are two completely different things. They're probably not your customer, right? But did it land? Did it make sense? Did it, did it, did it resonate? Did they go, oh, okay, yeah, that's kind of cool, right? Or whatever. Practice, practice enough times, but do not write a script. Scripts are bad. Uh, scripts get you into trouble because if you forget a line during your script, you get stuck because lines are about words. What you want to say is this is my outline. These are my big points and memorize that you have a few big points. The individual words aren't going to matter that much. Seth Godin uh, likes to uh, tell this, tell a story about um, there's a, people ask him all the time, like, how do you come up with so many like of these pithy little short phrases that resonate, like you're just like this fountain of all this stuff. And he says, he says, actually, I'm no better at it than anybody else. He said, I just run more experiments than you do. He says, I run 50 experiments a day. I come up with all different things. I try them all out to everybody that I talk to. I just try different ones. Most of them never work, but the ones that don't work are the ones you don't hear about. I just run more experiments than you do, right? So practice, practice, practice. That's how you get your phrasing right. Okay. Next. Um, okay. Clarity is always going to be the winner here. 
So complexity is, uh, it, I think in the real world, complexity is a virtue and a pitch complexity is a vice. You want to stand away from complexity. You want them to be clear about this is what I want you to take away. And you can talk around the point um, and say, Wait, this is some examples of this or examples of that or whatever, but you want them to take away the point. I want you to take away the point that clarity wins. So I could talk about some ways that clarity doesn't win, that you could have overcomplicated business model slides, that you could have a story about a customer that contains way too much information about the background that we really aren't interested in. And I could tell you some things about where clarity is does you a good job, things like, uh, how Airbnb had those three circles and how they're really easy to follow on the business model slide. And that is ultimate clarity at the end because it's so simple to follow. I can talk about all that stuff all day long, but the thing you're going to take away is that clarity is important, right? So have a clear narrative arc and make sure your slides are super clear. Okay, next one um, is to know your audience. So you have to know who they are. You have to know what they want and you need to cater your pitch to them. When it comes to investors, this is where you need to understand what their thesis is. Don't waste people's time, including your own. Don't pitch to investors where their thesis doesn't match what you're working on. And for, if you guys aren't familiar with investor theses, these are um, where this, uh, how they raised a fund. Uh, for an individual investor, it's going to be you know just their uh, their personal philosophy, but it's their it's going to uh, account for a lot of things like their risk tolerance. Um, so at what stage are they investing in? Do they only invest in idea stage companies, or do they invest only in Series A stage companies, etc.? Uh, are they do they tend to be lead investors, or they do not like to be lead investors at all? Are they do they invest in in blockchain technologies, or do they avoid all that new fine stuff? Right? Or do they invest only in a geographic region, or do they invest only in minority owned uh, or minority founders, or do they only only invest in women-owned businesses or whatever. Um, so know your audience, know who you're talking to, identify their thesis and be able to actually like speak directly, directly to that. Always know what they're after, cater your pitch to them. Um, okay. Lastly is don't try to be someone you're not. Uh, this happens a lot. Everybody tries to be somebody that they saw on Shark Tank or whatever. And they're like, I, that, that guy, I'm going to be like Steve Jobs. I'm going to give a Steve Jobs presentation. If that's not you, don't do it. Be you, be authentic, because as you guys all called out in the chat earlier, team matters, people matter, honesty matters. Be the per be yourself when you're pitching to investors, because that's going to you know, that's going to be what matters at the end. Okay, because we live in a new world, I'm going to give some quick bonus tips for presenting virtually. Okay. Practice your tech. Things can go wrong even when you do practice your tech. I've used this tech a lot of times. Things went wrong. You're going to have to roll with it, right? Practice your tech as best you can and then roll with errors. When you're pitching virtually, it's, yep, it's just going to happen. But make sure if they're making you use uh, WebEx instead of Zoom that you know how to screen share on WebEx, that kind of thing, okay? Um, the other thing is people seem to think that pitching uh, online is different than pitching in the, the the real world or that online meetings are different than in-person meetings. And that's not true. It's still a real pitch. So don't become complacent and like phone it in because the audience is virtual. You need to actually like hardcore focus in on this is just as important as the in-person is just as important as if they are sitting across the conference table for me right now. And even though you're online, please still don't read a script. Even though you don't have to memorize it, we can all tell. It ends up coming across like you are reading something that isn't very interesting and that at the end of the day is not super important to what I need to know. And I can keep vamping, but I should have actually written something though, so that I could read it that was more relevant. Um, no matter how good you think you are, very few people are actually good at reading from a prompter and you don't need to. So just don't do it. It's just bad. At the end of the day, you don't want people saying that pitch should have been an email. Okay. Uh, lastly is when you're online, it's really, really, really easy to be boring. <laughs> So you have to try really hard not to be boring. You have to have engaging visuals. You have to be, you have to have, you have to bring twice as much energy as you do in person. Because right now on our computer screen, sitting right in front of us are is chat, is email, is Slack, is this is TikTok. And we really want to open a new tab and we don't mind. It's all right there. You got to give us a reason not to do that. I will bet of the 30 plus people who are here here now that there are there's maybe one of you two of you maybe that did not do something else while I was talking. And one of those is me because I'm talking, right? Okay. So you have to try really hard to be, to be engaging. Okay. So we're reaching the end of this here. 
Uh, so uh, last couple of things. First, a brief word from our sponsors, which is me. Um, so this is my way of saying shameless plug. Before I open it up for Q&A and lose your attention, just want to give you a couple of things. So first is I would love to keep in touch with all of you. So there's my email address. Uh, I'll drop in the chat too, but you can send me an email. I'm happy to do that. Also, if you go to links.jdm.bio, which will also be again in the deck that Laura promised she would send out later on, you can connect with me there on, I create content on TikTok, on Instagram, on YouTube, on LinkedIn. Um, I have a couple of podcasts that are also out. So if you just want to keep in touch with me in any of those ways, please do. Um, and if if you were here today for, for this thing, then connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, there's a follow button there. You're welcome to just follow me, but also if you use the three dot, you can connect with me, but make sure you include a message that says that uh, that you were that you were here, um, and I will accept your connection request. If I just get a generic connection request, I, I just get too many of them. I probably won't won't know who you are, and I'll ignore it. Um, and I don't want to do that because I actually want to be connected with you guys. Two more things. One is uh, I mentioned one million cups earlier, and I come back to it here. So I'm one of the organizers, along with Laura, of one million cups Sacramento. And so every single Wednesday, at 9 a.m. right here on Zoom, we hear two presentations from startup founders. They get six minutes to talk about what they're working on, and then we, the audience of their peers, get 15 to 20 minutes to ask questions, provide feedback, advice, etc. So we learn from them; they learn from us. It's absolutely fantastic, really supportive environment. Um, so I, I, I invite all of you, if you're working on something, to submit an application to present. It's never too early. Um, people, if, if you're serious about it, that's enough for us. Um, you don't have to be like, oh, I, I just want to get this ready. I want to get that ready. I want to get my product launched. No, 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 no. Just, just come, just come and present. And we have some openings coming up in the next few weeks. Um, if you want to join us as Laura dropped in the chat in person tomorrow, we're going to be at Agstar in Woodland. So um, we'll be hybrid on Zoom as well. So you can still join us remotely, but come hang out with us in Woodland. How often do you get to hang out in Woodland? So there's that. Um, the last thing that I'll say there is that if you do, if you want me to uh, shred your pitch, if you want a little one-on-one -on -one attention, so I do offer like professional coaching on that. So if you actually want to like engage me for money and do that, that's a thing. But if this link here is actually different. So if you fill out this form, this is where I will shred your pitch. And all I ask in return uh, is that you let me include either it in whole or in part in some way on my social media. So it'll be a little bit more public. Um, I won't, I won't embarrass you. That's not the point. Um, but uh, it's a uh, content for me and I, it's fun content for other people. So um, if you hit up that link, jdm.bio slash pitch, there's a little form, you can fill it out, name me the address. I will happily shred your pitch for free. Uh, normally that costs a bit of money. So um, it's just a little thing I'm doing for both for funsies uh, and uh, and for, for value and content and everything else. And with that, of course, it is time for Q&A. So I'm going to kill my screen share and we will take uh, any questions you have. I'm going to quickly scroll the chat, see if I missed anything, but otherwise get your Zoom hands up or, or drop a new question in the chat. And we're going to talk about it. Uh, let's talk about it here. Um, let's see. Okay. Clarification question. When you said the story of the startup, you were referring to the 10 slides narrative, right? Not like this is why we are inspired. Correct. Correct. Most of the time, I don't care. Um, <laughs> that's not to say that it, it isn't interesting sometimes, like having passion for, um, for your effort can be very uh, inspiring. And that's important to some investors. It's not important to all of them. If it's super relevant, then yeah, include it in your, at the top, you can include that, that personal, that personal touch, that personal narrative. Um, the data on whether or not that makes a founder more successful is, is mixed. And so for some investors, they love it. And for other investors, they don't care. Um, but I was, yes, referring to the story of the business itself and, and, and how that shows up in the, in the slides. Okay, does the order of the slides matter? Um, yes, it matters, but do they need to be this specific order? No. This is a common order, but it's it's pretty common to shake it up. Some reasons to shake it up are going to be if you're at a stage where this tells a less compelling story. So you may want to put less emphasis on like your product roadmap if you are not in market yet. That's less interesting. Um, if you are not focused on revenue, then the financials are less interesting. Like if you're focused on LOI or if you're focused on some type, like if you're pre-seed and you actually are just getting tons and tons and tons of interested customers, like a beta wait list kind of thing, but not actually showing up in financials, then that's less, less interesting as well. So those are some reasons to shake it up. Another one is you're telling a story. So like you need to go by flow and the way that that story flows well, there's a limit to how much you can deviate without increasing our cognitive burden, but you can absolutely feel free to toy with this a bit. So yes, I would encourage you to play with it um, in a way that makes sense. 
Um, okay, a ton of questions in chat here. Okay, cool. Uh, all right, so Cameron asks, uh, when looking at a pre-seed and financial slide for pre-seed, is it more beneficial to utilize financial assumptions based on the research around reaching the next stage of milestones? My thoughts on this are providing an ask that reasonable based on stage. So um, it depends, it's going to depend a lot. So we use these miles, these markers, like, you know, friends, family, and fools and pre-seed, seed, series A, um, which are really just based on how much money you've, or like how many times you've uh, raised money. Uh, and then also a rough pointer of, you know, the amount of money, but also we're indicating the stage, which is how, really how I'm trying to use it here, is indicating what stage you are. So if you're really early stage where financials are meaningless, then you really want to be looking at innovation accounting, which is like, what is the most important measurement for us to be looking at right now? And why do we have data that shows that that's successful? And then more importantly than that is why do those metrics matter now such that success in those metrics means that we'll see that on the balance sheet later on. So you got to provide a more complex story for that. If you're doing an app where you're really banking on a premium model, for example, and, you know, so you have tons and tons of freemium users and no premium users, then that actually you're, you're signaling quite a bit of risk because you're, you're signaling, you're going to have tons and tons of cost with absolutely no evidence that people would convert to premium. So that premium conversion would have to be part of the story. And I don't know how you do that without the financials. Um, that's not true. I do know how you could do that without the financials, but that's the most compelling way to do it. Um, so um, is it, I wouldn't, I think assumptions are dangerous here when it comes to financials because financials can be bullshit and they often are bullshit, if particularly if the precede stage, most of the numbers are bullshit. Um, if financials are really important, like say you're doing manufacturing, so the cost of manufacturing relative to your market cost, um, that's really important. And so you better have some some data where they're, that like it's based on this, but that makes sense. And here's why that makes sense. And we've talked to X, Y, and Z, and that's how we know that makes sense. If you're doing a SaaS play, like you're just doing software, honestly, the financials aren't even interesting. The, how you're making money is interesting, but the costs of running um, a software startup are pretty well known, uh, and they are dramatically disproportionate to the profits of uh, severe pain. So I uh, hope that helps. Otherwise, um, Cameron, feel free to make it more specific. Um, if applying for a business plan competition, we follow the same advice to say, so a business plan competition tends to be very different. This business plan, I actually am a dramatic opponent of business plans. I think business plans are awful. I think business plan component, compo uh, plans serve one purpose, and that's to help you get traditional fund financing, like a bank loan um, or something like that. Now, that's, to, that's not to say that there's no place for a bank loan. There absolutely is a place for a bank loan. And when there's a place for a bank loan, a business plan is really important. And then you're having a lot of the same stuff within it, but they're going to uh, be packaged up in a completely different way. So let's set that aside. If you're working on a start, uh, something that I would call a startup, something that has that scalability component to it, um, it could be manufacturing, it could be software, it, it could be a number of things, but it has a scalability component to it such that equity investment makes sense. Business plans no longer make sense. So that's the that's the line that I would that I would draw there. So if you're in a business plan competition that's supposed to look like a business plan competition, a lot of what I'm telling you will translate, but the ten slide structure might not. I would look more at the rules for that particular competition. But it's all going to be the same stuff. It's just going to be packaged up in a, in a way that they're used to hearing that, which is probably going to be, I don't know for sure, but probably different than the way uh, an investor is used to hearing a startup pitch. Kind of what I'd say about that. Um, anybody uh, already applied to pitch, need to update the pitch deck after this? That's a good question. I'd like to know the answer to that as well. Um, should I have a working prototype for the pitch? Um, well, that depends on what you're pitching for. So, And it depends on what you mean by working prototype. Um, but here are some rules. So the further are along in you are in the process. So friends and family, friends, family, and fools on one side, and then you know, like series A on the other side. Uh, and the reason I use series A as a stopper is because the game changes at series A. It's a fundamentally different game after series A. So I'm just choosing this, and I don't think anybody here is racing past that right now. So um, if you look at that, that that kind of range, um, when you're really early on in that process, the working the working prototype might not be necessary. There are ways around that. When you get to Series A, there's really no way to avoid it. So it's gonna uh, it's gonna depend on where you're on that process. Also, it's gonna depend on what the best way to get data. Um, the story of um, 
Masterclass is a great example of how you can get early money um, and build something successful without having a prototype at all. They had incredibly robust customer validation from both sides of the market. And, uh, and then they took that and were able to get funding for it because once they did, building the platform is easy. That's the easy part. Um, so they're, like early money, you can do it really well if you can get that kind of customer validation, uh, maybe even letters of intent, that kind of thing, then building the simple software is the easy part. Um, for um, the working prototype, for other reasons, it's going to depend on what you're trying to learn from that. If, you're, if the most important thing is, does a customer have a problem, a pro working prototype doesn't help. If your most important thing is, will customers convert, a working prototype doesn't help. If it's, can I get customers to pay, it sometimes matters. If it's, can I get customers to retain, it always matters. If I can get customers to refer, it always matters. So depending on what you need to prove for that. So look at, this is what I need to prove, and then say, is the right thing I need to prove that a working prototype? Um, Oftentimes the answer will be yes, but sometimes it'll be no. And when the answer can be no, I would make it no because you can get to failing faster. Um, Laura answered the question about pitch length. Um, does a pitch have to be for a product or an app What about a consulting service? Um, I'll let Laura take any questions that are specific to uh, Pitch Elk Grove, uh, but this kind of format works for any kind of equity investment, which is less common for things like consulting services, but is potentially doable. Um, and I would say, now, go ahead. If you're entering a, a business plan competition or a pitch competition like Pitch Out Grove, read the information on, read the rules and the information provided on the site because most of your questions can be answered there. Cool. Um, Franklin said, uh, banker, landlord, and you are the only three that will read your business plan. So it's important that you understand that you put it on the shelf. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, okay. For pitching, can the two or more co-founders be an equal level or should there be one decision maker for investors? Um, <laughs> that is a, I, I actually don't think I've gotten that specific question before in doing this, but my, my answer would be, I think it's not different than almost any other kind of startup decision uh, is that there's going to be ways to to do it. Um, and I'll talk about that in a second. But first, quick aside, I my one of my uh, my first startup, scalable startup, not my first business, but my first scalable startup failed spectacularly. I made all of the mistakes. And but one of them that I made is that that kind of hamstrung us is that my co-founders and I could not agree on whether or not we wanted to raise equity investment. So I was in the camp that we were going to need this if we wanted to scale. Um, and so we needed to build toward getting to equity investment. And the other group didn't did not want to raise equity investment ever. And we we had four co we had four founders total. So we were split 50-50, which meant by default that's not raising equity. And because of that, that changed our whole strategy. And I don't know if that was the right decision or wrong decision. Like I said, we, we made every other mistake we could make as well. Um, but because we weren't on the same page about even our approach to the process, that's a signal that we were actually poorly, uh, poorly fitted to be co-founders together, right? Because that's, it's just not going to work well. And that's going to apply to a lot of different things. So if you guys are all on the same page about wanting to raise equity investment, then it's going to... Um, uh, it's going to have to be something that um, that you take like any other decision. So somebody's going to be pitching, but the investors are probably going to need to meet your co-founders anyway. Um, but somebody's going to be going to be pitching, and then you're going to come back and you're going to you know have to um, following the bylaws of your of your you know, and shareholder rules of your of your organization. You're going to have to do do your voting. Um, so you're actually making changes to the cap table, um, which is uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, Laura, but I think that usually takes a vote of the shareholders. Yes. Well, depending on your bylaws, but I would say yes. Um, also, in most cases, you aren't going to get an offer for investment during your pitch. If they're interested, they're going to want to um, enter into a stage that they call due diligence, where they're going to meet with you and your team. They're going to request a lot of information. Uh, then they're going to make an offer in terms of how much they want to invest. They might also negotiate the terms uh, that you put forth. So it's not going to be like on Shark Tank where they say, I'm going to invest $50,000 in your company or whatever. It, there, it's going to be a process. Uh, probably the fastest that I've seen that happen is like in three or four weeks. Um, 
well, actually I've seen it happen faster, but I would say something about like a month is probably a, a reasonable amount of time unless you've already gone through due diligence with other investors and all that information's together and the new group has an option to look at that information. That was probably cool. way, way out there, but. <laughs> no, that was, uh, that was actually good. Uh, you and I, Laura, interpreted the question differently. So um, that's, uh, we came at it from, from different sides. So hopefully it wasn't a third interpretation. Hopefully we answered the question between the two of us. Um, cool. Uh, and then founder dividends to co-founders as employees of independent contracts for purposes. I don't, know what that question is um but usually uh, but that has nothing with pitching so we'll we'll set aside um okay and then another question before pitching should we register our corporation well if you're pitching for investment then yes but i'm going to say i the reason i'm inflecting so much on that is that you know like if you're really early stage, like maybe some of that can get taken care of during due diligence, which can take a long time. Like we're talking about from like the time you pitched, like time you start pitching, the time you actually get a check is oftentimes like six months. So even though due diligence doesn't usually take that long, but it, it takes a period of time. So like I, I'm saying, yes, like inflected, but you can't actually get the money for equity investment until you have a corporation suitable to, um, to, to distribute the shares of equity. So, so yes, subject to some caveats, but I would say that if you if we if I take the question a little bit more broadly as like before we just start pitching, should we register as a corporation? No, start pitching as soon as you have an idea in your head. That's when you start pitching. Um, you start pitching to everybody, and that gets more robust. And then there becomes a time when it is necessary to to create the corporation and do all the formal stuff. But it's not on it's not on day one. Um. Okay. Uh, there was a question. I don't know if he's still here or not. It was early on about. Uh, what should be in your appendix of your deck? Ah, um, yeah, I unfortunately lost the chat when I had to reconnect, so I don't have any of the old stuff. Um, what should be in your appendix? Well, I think that always what should be in uh, an appendix is whatever is necessary to support a point in your main deck that you think will require further <laughs> clarification during your um, uh, during during Q and A. So. I mean, there are some patterns to it. It's it's oftentimes like financial details end up in there sometimes as well. Um, but again, like keep in mind that you're not pit. And I said this at the top. Laura repeated again in a minute ago. I'll say it, you know, for a third time here. You're not pitching for investment. You're pitching for another meeting, right? You're pitching for the follow up conversation, which means that like you don't. Your goal isn't to give them all of the information that they need to decide a firm yes during this conversation. And so off, so like, there's nothing wrong, I guess, with having an appendix there, like it's fine. Um, but there's going to be a lot of stuff in there that probably isn't the right forum to talk about, like during Q&A on a pitch, particularly in a pitch competition where that kind of thing won't come up at all. Um, the amount of times that I see uh, appendix slides used successfully or well, I mean, during pitch competitions or demo days or anything that's highly structured like that um, is pretty small. Uh, it just doesn't come up that often. It's usually clarifying something that was already talked about because it wasn't clear, not clarifying it because additional detail in the form of a slide is what's really relevant. But there's sometimes. Um, so, Yeah. Yeah, and um, I'd say if you're if you're invited to pitch to an angel group or VCs, um, a lot of times what I've seen in the appendix is <laughs> more detailed financial data. Yeah, like performance and stuff like that end up in there, yeah, or details um, about patent or something like that. So. Right. Yes. Yes. And I think there's also a difference between pitching live versus like submitting a pitch, right? Like right. some of that more detail is going to end up in the submitted version and they'll end up in the live version. Um, a slide on, on, on the details of your patent is not something we really want to sit through, but uh, something we probably want to know is there. Um, okay. Um, during due diligence, if an investor doesn't like something about our corp structure or anything, will they just reject us or will they ask us to change something? Well, that depends on the investor. Um, so some of them will... Uh, some of them will just like say not interested. Thank you. Um, if you make it into due diligence, like that's like that's a process for them. So like I imagine that they're not going to be super generic about it. If it's something as simple like to fix, then I would hope that most of them would 
say just like you just need to fix this thing because it's relatively straightforward if what they're seeing is a red flag that might be different so if instead of it just being like you did uh, an s corp instead of a c corp or something like that you know if it's some um, dramatic thing in there then they might see that as a red flag and choose to reject you anyway but it's really going to depend on, on on the investor um and a lot of this stuff is not complicated this stuff is really straightforward uh, we don't know it because we are not lawyers or tax accountants, right? But it's not complicated stuff. So when it comes time to set that up, hire somebody to do it for you. They will do it right the first time and you'll be fine. Um, so one slide on financials. I mean, yeah. Like, and again, it's going to depend on your stage. So if you're, I would never do multiple slides on financials unless you're also including business model as part of financials. But I had those as two slides. So keeping business model out of it for a moment. One slide on, on slides, I think, or one slide on financials is probably um, probably enough uh, subject to the caveat that, that Lauren, or that, that subject to the caveat that Laura mentioned in the chat. Um, that uh, details uh, are more relevant to certain audiences than they are to others. And you, again, keeping 10, 20, 30, keep your slide high level. You can always put more detail in an appendix. Um, and then any of the, like literally before they're gonna put you a check, like they're, they're gonna crack open your books. Like they're gonna have access to freaking everything about the company. Like they're gonna know all the stuff. So it's, we don't need to tell them the entire story here. It, we need to tell them the top line so that they, uh, see this as a credible investment and then the rest gets taken care of due diligence. Um, okay. Um, can you book appointments with me? Uh, I think I, I'm assuming you was me in that. Um, but uh, if, if you is me in that, yes, there are ways to book appointments with me. Uh, I, I can, there's a, there's a few ways to do it. So I'm going to drop a, uh, a link in the chat, but um, the, they can't type one thing and say something else at the same time. So there's there's the link. So uh, if you want to actually just like book a coaching session with me, you can absolutely do that at the link in there. There's one that's specifically made for your pitch deck. Um, I have others on business model and on prototyping and so forth. So if there's something that interests you there, you can certainly do uh, do that. Outside of that, though, outside of like a, a professional coaching relationship, there are a couple of ways. So one, I'm at 1 Million Cups almost every week. So if you want to present at 1 Million Cup and get some feedback that way, it's a great way to just get some kind of low-key thing and make some cool friends. So you should do that anyway. Um, but then outside, uh, other than that, uh, Laura mentioned in, in the intro that I have uh, something called the Startup Traction Hotline, uh, which is my office hours. So I have a live stream every Thursday at 10 a.m. on YouTube, 10 a.m. Pacific on YouTube. And so if you can actually submit a question to me, uh, a video question or a written question, and um, I will answer it live on the air as well. So if there's some like way you want that as well. Outside of that, I'm also happy to connect with people, um, you know, and just uh, just stay connected and, you know, do conversations and LinkedIn and uh, an email and so forth. So definitely keep in touch. And with that, I've been played off stage. <laughs> not not off stage. We're just about out of time, though. So I wanted to uh, respect that for the people who need to leave at one. Um, first, I want to thank Josh, uh, JDM, so much for sharing this information with us. We'll share the slides and the video with you in the next couple of days. For those of you who aren't familiar yet with Pitch Out Grove, it's a contest happening here in the greater Sacramento region. And uh, you, you can go to the link that I just posted in the chat and find out more information about uh, who the ideal candidate is, how to apply, uh, all of those things. Um, I'll stick around a little bit if you have questions after that. Then I uh, also want to let you know that, whoops, um, you can check out the past, the archive of past office hour sessions on the Startup SAC website. And I put the link in the chat. <laughs> and then, as Josh mentioned, check out One Million Cup Sacramento. It's, <laughs> sorry, it's a great way to continue this conversation around, uh, you know, presenting your company. And then I invite you to sign up for the Startup Digest, which I curate, comes out every Monday morning, and it's got information about everything that's happening for startup founders and small business owners. And then we also have a Facebook group that you're, you're welcome to join. I think that's it there. So let me stop sharing. So well, I'll thanks for letting me hang out with you guys. Yeah, for sure. Um, 
I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. Stop.